Do we live in a simulation? Yes. I mean, no. I mean, well, it's, it's more complicated. Today we're going to talk about the simulation hypothesis. Let's just get started with what this hypothesis really is. So let's assume for the sake of argument, that as time goes on, computers get ever more powerful. They get better and better, more and more efficient, and get bigger and bigger, and they could do more complex things. Let's say that at some point in the distant future, doesn't matter when, it could be next year, it could be 100,000 years from now, it doesn't matter for this argument, that computers become so powerful, so incredibly vast, capable of crunching so many numbers that they can simulate the entire universe. Yeah, and, and yeah, this is pure sci-fi, but, but let's go there. Let's, for this argument, let's say we have a computer the size of a planet. That's no moon. That uses a black hole as a power source. It is like 100% computer, and it is so powerful that it can simulate the entire universe down to some subatomic level, and it can recreate all the physics. And from all the physics come all, comes all the chemistry and the biology, and that eventually in this little simulated universe, there are simulated creatures that have consciousness, that they are aware of their surroundings. Now, they don't know that they're in a simulation. They look around, they have their senses, the food tastes the same, everything, the stars on the sky, they have a history of archeology, span the, the whole deal. They are pure conscious entities. Now, let's also assume that consciousness is consciousness, that a consciousness that resides inside of a, a skull made of a bunch of meat is the exact same kind of consciousness that resides inside of a computer chip uh, in, embedded in a simulation. That if you're conscious in a simulation, unless somebody tells you, you don't know that you're in a simulation. There are no clues, there are no giveaways, that you're just alive and you're living your life and you're watching YouTube videos and you're just doing what you normally do. It seems fair to say, this argument goes, that eventually computers will become powerful enough to simulate the entire universe and have simulated consciousnesses inside of them. As soon as we have the capability to do that someday in the future, we're going to do it a lot. We're not going to stop at one universe simulation with one artificial consciousness. We're going to have a lot of simulations. We're going to turn that thing on. We're going to turn it off. We're going to have five computers in a row all doing five different universes. We are going to restart it. We're going to monkey around with it. We're just going to go nuts with this. This is pretty reasonable. I mean, look at what we do with the simulated worlds that we can create, which are not recreations of our physical universe, but are still pretty impressive. Like, like look at Minecraft, right? Once you start having Minecraft, you, you don't stop having Minecraft. You have all these simulated worlds constantly being turned on and turned off and restarted and tweaked and updated. Think of all the entities all the pigs and, and zombies. Think of how many there are. And as time goes on, the number of simulated Minecraft entities grows to be in, an incredibly large number. Once we are capable of building simulations of the universe, this is going to skyrocket and we are gonna have a ton of artificial consciousnesses. And very quickly, the number of artificial consciousnesses that's what a weird word. The number of artificial brains will vastly outnumber the amount of organic brains. And if we assume that there's no special difference between simulated brains and organic brains, then you can ask yourself, what are the chances that you, you are actually living in a simulation? If you follow this chain of logic, then you end up with a trilemma, which is like a dilemma, but even more so. There are three statements. Three statements, and at least one of them must be true. If you accept everything else in the argument, at least one of these statements must be true. Statement number one, for some reason, intelligent beings are incapable of developing the computing technology to simulate the entire universe. Okay, maybe that's true. Maybe this never plays out for some reason. Option number two, for some reason, intelligent beings do develop the capability to make universe simulations, but choose not to. It's a possibility. 
or option number three, the vast majority of conscious beings are simulated and therefore you are likely to be in a simulation. Because once we turn this on, if there are 1 billion meat brains and 99 billion simulated brains, you have a 99% chance, all else being equal, of you being in a simulation. This is the simulation argument. This is the simulation hypothesis put forward first in 2003 by philosopher Nick Bostrom over at Oxford. And before I dig into poking at this hypothesis, at this argument, we need to talk about what the hypothesis isn't and was it what it is. So let's start with what the simulation hypothesis is definitely not. The simulation hypothesis is definitely not a theory of physics. This does not come to us from our understanding of the physical nature of reality. This does not come to us from a mathematical application of logic to modeling how the universe works. Uh, The simulation hypothesis does not offer testable predictions. I mean, yes, if we're living in a simulation and the creators of the simulation uh, sent us all a message telling us we're in a simulation, that's technically like testable, but not in, in in the physics way. There's no observation we could make to determine if we truly do live in a simulation or not. So this is not a theory of physics. This is not a scientific theory. But this is also not pseudoscience. I've seen some scientists criticize the simulation argument calling it pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is false science. This is literally the definition of pseudoscience. Pseudoscience is when you're taking the some ideas of science, like instrumentation, observation, and lots of cool jargon, and not taking the rest, like critical thinking, or in analyzing your own bias, or submitting your work to criticism from your peers, or taking your theories 100% seriously, like UFOlogy, or or cryptozoology, or or ghost hunting. This is pseudoscience because it looks like science. There's gizmos, and there's record keeping, but they don't take their own ideas seriously and actually flesh out their theories and the implications of those theories and look for testable predictions and are willing to be wrong about it, which is an essential ingredient in science. I'm saying it's all real. Like a dozen other people say it's all real. This is a simulation argument. This is a hypothesis. This is not any of that. This is not pseudoscience. This is not pretending to be science. It's simply its own thing, its own way of thinking. This is also not religion. This is not an argument in favor or against a creator or a deity. It just has has nothing to do with it. It's it's not. Simulation argument is also not a new method of agriculture. There's a long list of things it's not. The simulation argument also doesn't rely on there being an infinite chain of simulated universes where you have an organic universe and then in that organic universe they make a simulated universe and then they make a simulated universe and universe of universe and that's how you get all these simulated brains. No, it doesn't rely rely on that. All it relies is on this happening at least once where somebody or our descendants make a simulated universe and then the number of simulated brains gets really, really, really big, vastly outweighing the number of organic brains. That's the cornerstone of the argument. The simulation hypothesis is also not a conclusive argument that we do live in a simulation. The simulation argument that Nick Bostrom put out in 2003 ends with the trilemma that I just discussed, ends with those three options, ends with maybe nobody can do this, maybe nobody chooses to this, or maybe we do live in a simulation, but it stops there. Of course, you can have your own personal preference. Nick Bostrom has owned his personal opinions, but you can't attach any odds to that. You can't calculate any odds to that because it ends with the trilemma. That's as far as this argument takes you. And so you can't point to the simulation argument and say, yep, we definitely live in a simulation, or I think we live in a simulation. No, you can't. If you start saying things like, yes, we do, yes, we don't, as as you're basing it purely on the simulation argument, you can only stop at the trilemma. Now, what is the simulation hypothesis? It's philosophy. 
It's philosophy. And philosophy is amazing. It's a shame I see so many scientists and fans of science disparage philosophy, mock philosophy, uh, call it useless. I mean, science is literally a branch of philosophy. I have a PhD that stands for Doctor of Philosophy. Science is philosophy. It's a kind of philosophy. So one group of philosophers telling another group of philo philosophers they're being useless or not being productive, that's kind of amusing to me. Uh, it makes it cringy when I see scientists like Neil deGrasse Tyson mocking philosophy, but then following the simulation argument and saying, well, I do think we live in a simulation or a 50-50 chance we live in a simulation. But, but this is a philosophical argument. Weren't you just making fun of philosophers and now you're agreeing with them? So it'd be funny if it weren't so cringy. So I encourage you, if you see a scientist making fun of philosophy, I need you to slap them for me. And just love philosophy, asking these kinds of questions the, about the fundamental nature of reality and, and questioning our assumptions is good and fruitful and useful because it keeps us moving forward. The simulation argument is the latest and perhaps most sophisticated version of a long line of thinking called the skeptical argument. You know, skepticism is you know, just asking questions and not believing on face value. If I tell you that uh, the universe is 13.77 billion years old, you say, well, how do you know? That's skepticism and that's healthy skepticism. And all, I'm a big fan of skepticism. There are different levels of skepticism that you can apply and you can go all the way to the maximum level of skepticism where I say the universe is 13.77 billion years old. And you say, how do you know? And then I talk about cosmic microwave background and, and dark matter and, and a lambda CDM cosmology and all that. And then you say, okay, how do you know what you're looking at is real? How do you know that this is the universe? What if this is all just an illusion? This is an important question because it, it, it stops us, it checks us, and it makes us really consider what is the nature of reality, what is the nature of our observations, what is the nature of our perception of reality, and that these are important questions to ask. Right? There's been, what, a thousand philosophy papers written about the matrix because the matrix encapsulated a lot of these long-standing philosophical ideas. For example, philosophers going back to antiquity and probably prehistory have been debating this and thinking about this. Like, is there some evil demon with magical powers that is tricking us? Are we in a dream? Uh, yes, we can tell the difference between dreams and not dreams, but that's only once we wake up. When you're in the dream, it's kind of hard to know you're in a dream. Uh, maybe the universe was just created five minutes ago with all of our memories intact and all the photons and all the chemical reactions midway. We, would, we wouldn't know the difference. Maybe we live in a simulation. So if we are going to take the simulation argument or simulation hypothesis seriously, we have to take it seriously on the grounds it was made of, which is philosophy grounds, which is on the basis of argumentation and rationality. Uh, so we can't apply religious techniques to this. We can't apply science, say, well, an no physics observation says we live in a sim Okay, no, this is a philosophical argument, so let's take it seriously as a philosophical argument. There are a couple different ways to, to address the simulation argument. One way is to accept the line of arguing that leads to that trilemma, that choice, that, that three-pronged choice. Accept all those arguments and say, okay, all that's totally cool. And then talk about the trilemma itself and, and weigh the various options and see if one option is more favorable than the other. But you don't even have to do that. You have a choice. You can read and understand the simulation argument, end at the trilemma, and then throw your hands up in the air and say, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we live in a simulation. Maybe it's uh, impossible to build simulations like that. Maybe if we had the capability, we just would choose not to. If we found out that all the zombies and pigs in Minecraft were conscious entities, there, we, we might actually stop playing Minecraft. I don't know that for sure, but, but it's a possibility. And you just don't know. You don't have to make a choice. The simulation argument does not compel you to make a choice about the nature of reality. It just raises these questions. And you can be fine with that ambiguity if you want to be.
or you can accept all the arguments that went into the simulation hypothesis and, and argue for one option or the other. You can say, uh, okay, you know what? I really do think we live in a simulation, but you need to back that up because there needs to be more argument, more logic to support why you think we live in a simulation because the simulation argument itself stops at the trilemma and that's the end of that road and you need more logic and more work. You need to do more homework if you want to say we live in a simulation. But you might say, you know what? It does seem likely that we're gonna build these supercomputers. It does seem likely that we're not gonna stop ourselves. It does seem likely that we're gonna have a, b a bajillion simulated brains. Therefore, I am likely to be a simulated brain. Or you might argue, uh, we never reach the capability to build computers like that because we'll, we'll destroy ourselves, we'll kill ourselves. There's some filter applied that prevents us from building computers like that, which is, kind of dark, but it's also an option if you accept the rest of the arguments in the simulation hypothesis. Or you can say, yes, of course, we'll have the ability to simulate universes, but of course we're not going to because that would be immoral, that'd be wicked, that that uh, anyone who tries to do that, we're just gonna just put them in prison for the rest of their lives. We're not gonna allow that stain on humanity by allowing ourselves to do it. And so we're not going to have this giant number of simulated brains and I'm likely to be organic. That is fine. You are allowed to make any one of those cases. The simulation argument, as long as you accept all the assumptions that go in, allow you to say any one of those statements, but you have to back those up on your own. And so that's your journey. My journey that we're going to explore for the rest of the video is questioning the assumptions that go in to the simulation argument. The simulation argument, in order to reach that trilemma, assumes certain things. It assumes that eventually we will have a computer powerful enough to simulate the universe. It assumes that once that computer switches on, there'll be a vast number of simulated consciousnesses. It assumes that simulated brains are identical to organic brains, their experiences are just the same. And it assumes that everything else is equal so you can just go ahead and calculate those odds and conclude that you're likely in a simulation. That is the argument. That's what it, those are the assumptions it makes. We don't have to believe these assumptions. We can talk about these assumptions. For example, it may not be possible to build a simulation of the universe that is 100% faithful. In Bostrom's original work in 2003, he addressed this. He said, okay, maybe you don't need a quantum description of the entire universe throughout the entire universe. Maybe you have some sort of zooming or multi-scale thing where if I just look at a table, it's just a table, but then I look at it through a microscope and then it boots up locally the chemical description of a table. And if I look at it uh, with a scanning, scanning electron microscope, it boots up the quantum nature of the table, but only in that area so it can save resources and power. I don't think that's quite possible, that kind of zooming based on perception and observation, because there are so many macroscopic properties of the universe that only come about through a collection of countless quantum interactions, like heat and temperature and pressure. The temperature and pressure of the air in this room and the air in your room depend on countless interactions. And without those countless interactions, you know, we wouldn't have the thermodynamics. And yes, we have a thermodynamic description, but in order to make that work, what's underlying it is a more quantum nature of reality that you do have to simulate. Or, or the interactions of, of radiation, the interplay of light and matter. Uh, these are happening at subatomic scales all over the place. The interaction of electrons with the vacuum energy. They're happening all the time and are required uh, for, for stability in our universe. Like I think you have to go down to all the way, the pure quantum level and probably beyond quantum level. We do not have a theory of everything. We do not understand all the physics in the universe. And in order to build a universe simulator that is 100% faithful, we need to have all those. We need to have a theory of everything. And if we don't have a theory of everything, then by necessity, our universe simulator will just be an approximation of the original universe, in which case there will be a difference between simulated brains and organic brains and the argument falls apart. So I think we do 
need to 100% capture the entire microphysics of the universe in order to get a simulation to work. The best way I can explain this argument is that if we want our simulated universe to be 100% accurate, then that simulated universe doesn't just have conscious beings, it has conscious beings capable of building their own simulator. Your simulation needs to be sophisticated enough that it can have a simulated universe inside of it. And the simulated universe is going to be a very complex thing and it may be beyond the computing capabilities of the original computer, the original simulation, to have a simulation of itself inside of it. You know, this is a computing thing. You can't have a processor inside of a processor that is just as fast, just as capable, captures all the complexities and computations that the original processor has. So as the simulation progresses, it is going to lose fidelity, it is gonna lose faithfulness, and so there will be differences between simulated brains and organic brains, and the argument assumes that simulated and organic brains are identical, that our experiences are identical, because if there is a difference, then you just don't know. So, so we may not even be able to build a computer that can simulate our universe. That is a big assumption to me. Another big assumption is in counting the number of simulated brains and assuming that that number of simulated brains is going to grow exponentially, maybe it's incredibly difficult to do this. Maybe there's only 10 simulated brains for every thousand organic brains because it turns out it requires an enormous amount of resources. It's not necessarily a given that once, even with superhuman planet-sized computers with black hole batteries, that we can have the computing power to do this. And we don't know ahead of time. Let's say there are 99 billion simulated brains and a billion organic brains. You can't just directly assume that there is, a, okay, therefore a 99% chance that you're simulated. Yes, it is a fair assumption, but it's still an assumption. You know, if I give you a coin, at first glance, you'll assume it's a fair coin, it's 50-50 heads or tails. But the only way to truly know if it is a fair coin is to flip it a bunch and measure the outcomes and make sure it's 50-50 heads and tails. Yes, given 99 billion simulated brains and 1 billion organic brains, you can assume that it's, there's a 99% chance that you are simulated, but it's not a guarantee. There's no guarantee on the box. The only way to actually study that probability, the chances, the odds, is to make observations and experiments, and you can't because the simulated universe is identical to the original universe. And so you can't truly know the probabilities. And so that is a major assumption. Here's another approach to this. This is courtesy Brian Eggleston at Stanford, who said that uh, Nick Bostrom's original argument relied on our descendants, our future descendants, thousands of years from now, building a supercomputer and having a simulated universe. Once they do that, the number of simulated brains skyrockets, and then we can assume that we're likely to be in such a simulation. But, but, we can't use the simulated brains that our descendants make because we'll know they're simulated. You know, if you were around tomorrow and tomorrow we're able to build a, a universe in a box and that universe in a box has conscious entities that argue with each other and make cheese and YouTube videos and play Minecraft, you can point to them and say, well, uh, well they're definitely simulated. And yeah, we have 25 billion simulated brains on our Minecraft server, you know they're simulated. It doesn't tell you if you are simulated or not. It doesn't tell you about your past. So we can't rely on our future selves building enormous numbers of simulations to tell us anything about our probabilities of being in a simulation. Our probabilities descent depend on our ancestors having the, the ability or some alien species out there somewhere having the ability and making human sim simulations. We don't know. We don't know how common life is in the universe. We don't know how common intelligent life is in the universe. We don't know how much time they've had. Have they had 13 billion years? Have they had 100 billion years? We don't know what our past is. We don't know what the past history of intelligence truly is. And so we don't know really 
if there is an overwhelmingly large number of simulated brains. We only know if we were to make a simulation, we would know that the people in that simulation are definitely simulated, but it doesn't tell us about ourselves. So we actually can't calculate these probabilities as reliably as you think we could. My takeaway from the simulation argument do we live in a simulation? We don't know. There's no experiment that we could perform that could tell us that we do. This is an interesting line of argument, but it is not a persuasive line of argument one way or the other. It doesn't tell us, yes, we definitely live in a simulation. It doesn't tell us, no, we definitely don't. So you can't take the simulation hypothesis and say, yep, we live in a simulation. And you also can't take it and say, nope, we definitely don't. We don't know the difference and truly, it's an interesting thing to think about. That's what the point of philosophy is to think and progress and argue. These are good arguments to have. And if we are living in a simulation, I kind of like it. Good job. I don't know why they're up there. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, even if this is a simulation. You know, if this is a simulation, I'm hungry right now but I need to eat because a simulated death is probably like just as unpleasant as a real one.